Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday night's presentation. Uh, tonight is the MacGyver Day session. It's uh, April Fool's Eve Eve. Uh, just to give you an idea of some of the nonsense that may go on, just like last year, we're going to do a Rat Pack Committee group presentation. I'm Anthony KZT, and I'll be handling the slideshow, but we'll be having a number of people speak up for the slideshow today. And tonight, it's featuring Oscar MacGyver himself, KP4RF. You might recognize the face if you look around the screen there. And you can find all this uh, information at tiny.cc slash fools dash eve uh, for the links in the presentation tonight. And Dan will make all that available on the website. Disclaimer, tonight's program, although primarily being presented by one person, is a joint effort of many. Some slides involving MacGyver techniques might be dangerous. Please take appropriate safety precautions as necessary. Please be aware of Friday's date as you watch this presentation. And warning, warning, warning. Please be ready to share your own amateur radio MacGyverisms at the end of this talk. By attending this session, you're required to do that. If you have any pictures, get them ready to share with us also online. But 3D printing stories do not apply unless, of course, you built your own 3D printer out of found items in your car's glove box, between the couch cushions, or it is wholly organic in nature. So before we get started, just a little bit about uh, MacGyver hams. Uh, these are two quotes I have, one from Jeff KE9V. The ham radio operator is like MacGyver. Bad guys put him in a tough situation, then he uses clever methods to get himself out of those tough spots. Except in ham radio, it is the radio operator who puts himself in these tough spots and devise, then devises clever means to get himself out. And a quote from Anthony K3NG. I think the MacGyver concept can also explain the public's perception, perception of amateur radio. One cannot really appreciate MacGyver's ingenu ingenuity unless A, they benefit from it, i.e. he saves the day, or B, if they themselves are MacGyver's with the knack for doing what he does. So the public often just doesn't get what we do. And what group could possibly be more macgyver than hams? We even call our spare parts reserve a junk box. So first of all, we're going to go through some a shopping list of some items you might want to add to your MacGyver kit. Uh, duct tape, Swiss Army knife, and I definitely suggest you get the one that has the pliers in it. There's a couple models that have pliers, can be very invaluable in the field. Paper clips, the large size seems to be best. Uh, Luneman foil, plastic wrap, drinking straws, chewing gum, and gaffer's tape has been suggested. It's used in the film, TV, stage production. The stuff is more expensive than duct tape, but it is so much better and stickier. Empty pill bottles. And if you still have them around, 35 millimeter film canisters. I still have a bunch of them in my junk box ready to be used for projects. A butane soldering iron can be very helpful in the field. Ziploc bags have numerous numbers of uses. A flashlight is always handy to have, and a Timex camper watch. I guess I have mine off right now, but it's here on the counter. Uh, mine has the built-in compass, which is very helpful. Strike anywhere matches are always useful. Steel wool, shoestrings, candles, and moldable, moldable glue can be very helpful. So let's get into our first MacGyver project, and uh, this is DIN, Mini, DIN, Molex, or any kind of plug that you might have. These plugs always drove me crazy. Not only do they have multiple arrangements of pins, but they have different numbers of pins and they're different sizes. Although they're shown all the same size here, there's different diameters. And you never seem to have the one you need. So I came up with a quick way to make temporary, which in MacGyverism means probably for the rest of the time I'll be using the equipment, by using two things I could find very easily around the house a standard wine bottle cork and a thick uh, paper clip. Although in some cases you might need to use the thinner ones depending on the size of the pins that you're replacing. Alligator clips can then be used for temporary connections or you can get really efficient and solder onto the paper clips themselves. Cut the cork into a half an inch to three quarter inch disc. Unbend the paper clips on one end. Create a paper template of the holes in the socket and line it up on top of the cork. Then push straight the straight end of the paper clips through the cork 
in the proper pattern using the template. Attach alligator clips to bend the ends of the paper clip. Press the cork down on the table so it makes all the pins the same depth and insert into your device to utilize it. Now I'm going to go over to Dennis because Dennis has this variation on the cork uh, uh, trick. Dennis, take it away. Oh yeah, okay, Anthony, thank you. Yeah, anybody who's ever played with R390s and R390As and any of the receivers like that, the military that have the twin axe connector, know the problem of trying to connect up to that uh, twin axe um, uh, antenna connector. You know, you're tempted to use that single-ended coax connector that's right next to it. The problem is that the signal level is way, way down when you use that. There's a there's an input stage that gets bypassed. So I've been doing this since the mid-70s <laughs> for R390s and R398s that I've had, is I just take a couple of like 22 uh, AWG wire, strip it, bend the end over, and shove it right in the connector. And uh, I've got radios that have had that set up for years and years and years. But I like the cork, Anthony. That's really cool. And of course, I added a ballon to get the balanced uh, feed from the uh, from the um, antenna. And of course, you want to strain relief that. And I just hung the coax over the the uh, power cord uh, uh, where you can coil the power cord up on the back of the radio, and that strain relieves it quite nicely. So I there you go. I think that's actually a coax hanger there. I think that's multi-purpose. Well, it's really for it really is for the power cable. That's what it was originally meant intended for. <laughs> so our next uh, couple of things involve forgetting something at home. I'm sure many of you went out to operate in the field and forgot something at home. You've traveled to a portable site with your radio and vertical, but you forgot the wire for the radials at home. Using the radio, the vertical without the radials would not be very effective. One of the things I've done is find a chain link fence. Mount the antenna to the fence corner, attach small grounding wire to make sure that the fence uh, is attached to the, the ground of the antenna, and voila, a two-dimensional, multi-stranded radial wire. And I have actually ran this for a number of years. This has not just been a temporary solution, but has been used in a number of settings uh, to utilize my chain link fence. Now, sometimes... We don't forget the radials, we forget the antenna itself. So you need to come up with an antenna. Fortunately, in this case, we did remember the coax. And by lopping off one end of the coax, stripping back some of the, the coax uh, shield, we can create something called a flower pot vertical antenna. And there's a link and a video available for more information. Again, the links will show up in this presentation. You can simply click on them and go out and get information. Here's it. Uh, how to from VK2 Z Oscar India on creating a six meter uh, half wave flower pot antenna, but you could adjust it to any frequent any frequency that you'd like by changing the measurements for it. And he goes into detail of how to do it and how to set it up, and he gives a little SWR curve for it. There's also a video available on that, and here's an example of spiffing it up so you can put it in the yard and keep it there as a permanent fixture outside the house. So a flower pot vertical is one way to go if you forget the antenna. Another way, and I'll let Dennis take over again. Okay, yeah, emergency, if you've got the coax and uh, don't have the antenna, you can just strip the, uh, strip the insulation, the outer, outer jacket off the coax carefully, loosen up the braid and uh, basically fold it back over the the, um, the insulation and that's actually incorrect on there it should be a, that should be a half wave dip what it is is a vertical dipole so instead of one wavelength in length uh, it's going to be a half wavelength from the tip of the uh, of the uh, uh, center conductor which you can leave the insulation on that you don't have to take the insulation off but just fold that co the braid back over the insulation of the the lower uh, quarter wave and uh, there you go. And you can hang it up in a tree or hang it, you know, if it's small enough, hang it indoors. You know, use it indoors, like if you're on a deployment. So I have done this many times and it works. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Anthony. Well, we've all heard of a, a, a J-pole antenna, but what happens if you don't have the right materials to build a J-pole? In this case, we've used leftover vinyl siding to support the scrap wire taped to the sides to form the J-pole shape. Then it was hung in a tree. 
and uh, you can see it right here in this picture. There's a link here on details on how to build this and can be scaled to other bands. So don't worry if you don't have nice copper pipe to build your J-pole. Uh, you can build it out of any scrap wire that you might have around if you can find something to support it on. Now, one of the things about MacGyver projects are Mag MacGyver project cases. And my wife always laughs at some of the very strange things I put my radio equipment into. When I build kits or homebrew something, quite often I need a, I need a case right now. And I could spend a lot of time and money on a case, but it's just, they're so expensive. And I don't have a 3D printer, so I keep look on the lookout for items going into the trash around the house that can be used for cases. Food packaging. Uh, plastic bottles, pill bottles, mint tins. Well, we all know about the Altoids and the obsessive QRPers with the radios in their Altoid tins. Uh, tea tins, plastic storage boxes, uh, generically generically uh, known as Tupperware. And in the olden days, 35 millimeter film canisters were great, especially for inline adapters. I could put a R, uh, quarter inch plug or an eighth inch plug on one side and run a cable out the other end with a plug on it and make nice little adapters that way. So here's an example of a project that I wanted to put together when I got my KX3. I wanted to put together a small interface so I could do both radio control and key the radio using uh, N1MM software. And I use a circuit that I've used many times before using an opto isolator, a resistor, and a diode. Uh, in this case, it was a serial output, and then I used a USB to serial adapter. So I had everything built, all ready to go, but I had no case, and I wanted to use it immediately. So here's my case. You can notice the uh, serial port on the one side and the two wires coming on the other side. And if you're of Italian heritage, you can probably even guess what month of the year I was building this. For those of you that aren't Italian, this is something called Tyrone, and it's a candy that is eaten with nougat and almonds in it and a, a wafer on both sides of it. It's always around during the Christmas season. So this was obviously my December project, and I used this small little box. And my wife says that we have plenty of boxes around. I should replace this one because it's gotten crunched a little bit over time. It's traveled around for a number of years. This is at least 8 or 10 years old that I've had this. Sometimes the case can be a little fancier, but again, I never want to use the case for what it was designed for. So here we take a tackle box designed for fishing. This is the Plano, uh, I forget the, the exact model number on it, but I have a link here with more details on it. And I've housed my KX3 in here, what's called a rapid deployment go box. I simply flip the top up, flip the front down, and I can actually snap it off if I want to, and attach the antenna to the side of the radio, and it's ready to operate. So it's a rapid deploy go box. Here's the link for more information on building it. And actually, that's the wrong link. I'll have to fix that. I will fix that link later, but let me just get to the right spot here. Okay, it's here somewhere. This is my website, by the way, so I can go and find it here, hopefully. And of course, when you're trying to find something in a hurry, you don't find it. So I will bring that up later. But I have instructions on how to build it, including a template for drilling out the holes on the side here. This could also be used for other radios. The ICOM 705 fits in there perfectly. The KX2 fits in there with a lot of space to spare. And the Shigu uh, X6100 or X5105 all fit very well into this case. On the top, I have my lithium-ion battery, phosphate battery, and uh, other accessories, including all the wiring, which is running down here, so I can just open the top and use it. Anthony? Oh, yes, and by the way, before, one second... You get all these nice little carrier cases in here, so it gives you a bunch of little plastic boxes with compatible uh, with compartments in it. Yes, go ahead, Marty. Yes, uh, there was a uh, question in, uh, in the chat about putting the links in chat, but the links will be live in the PDF that you can download with this the video uh, after it's done, right? Yes, they will be. They'll all be okay. in the in there, and you can just simply click on them and go, and That's they'll, be, okay, they'll be fixed too. So it'll be the correct link, <laughs> as this one is incorrect. Um, 
actually, you know what, that link, oh, I did have that link in there for a purpose. This link shows an ex other example of a case. This is a pencil case. I built, put together a few years ago, I put together a little project that takes the seven character display from an Ica, from an Elecraft KX2, KX3, or K3. And normally there's seven characters here for the display of decoded uh, CW or RIDI. And I've designed a little kit to use as an Arduino and then a 80 character display. Well, I needed something to put it in, so I found out that I could use pencil cases. And when I built these up as kits and distributed them, I found out I could pack everything in the pencil in the pencil box, and then sell it that way. And then the person could cut the hole in it and mount the LCD panel in the lid of that, and have their own little kit here ready to go. There's two examples here. This has rounded corners. This has square corners. So I guess that link was in there for a purpose. Okay, uh, we're now up to Marty. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I've uh, participated in uh, something around 20 or so uh, contest de expeditions around the world. In some cases, you're going where there's an existing station. In other cases, you bring everything with you, or you hope you bring everything with you. Um, in the case of uh, uh, this particular photo, uh, we were in uh, Banjul, the Gambia, and I'll be giving the talk on the whole Gambia operation tomorrow evening on the Thursday night Rack Pack group. But uh, we, to put it shortly, we had a voltage surge that took out a lot of our power supplies just a few hours before the contest. And uh, we were operating from what used to be an old AM pirate radio station where the tower had blown over. And so there were lots of old uh, boneyard parts and this is the an SB220 that was going to be used on 40 meters. And uh, the uh, high voltage caps from the power supply had blown because of our 220 volt that became 400 and some volts. So uh, I think next slide. <clears throat> so we ended up taking a big uh, broadcast capacitor that clearly wouldn't fit in the case, wired it up uh, in, where the uh, cap caps would have gone in the uh, power supply of the SB220 left the lid off the back and just ran it that way. Now, obviously, uh, there, there's, there's more than one uh, way to say you don't want to operate barefoot. Uh, and of course, we had our, our, our late W6XD there who had uh, the biggest feet in the group, <laughs> but he kept his shoes on and uh, uh, managed not to uh, get his feet near the uh, high voltage cap, but it kept us going for the rest of the contest. Next. I had a dog laying on my feet when I operated in a contest in Puerto Rico that I'm sure would have licked the terminals on that. <laughs> All right. Uh, here we were in Jamaica, and I was using somebody else's rig on 160, uh, and I was getting reports of uh, bad audio feed, you know, RF feedback on the audio line. So we went into the kitchen and uh, basically got enough foil to wrap most of the uh, mic cord uh, heading into the... Uh, heading into the radio's uh, mic front panel mic connector. I got some rubber bands to tighten it up and, and uh, clamp it around the, uh, the threads of the mic connector and that solved the problem and we continued on. Next. Okay, uh, I, I think that's it for mine, although I did have one other I wanna mention and that is when uh, we, uh, we were operating from uh, Jordan, uh, Amman, Jordan, and uh, we got to our hotel that night and we were up on the fourth or fifth floor and I couldn't wait to get on the air from there. I had my TS 930, my trusty traveling rig at the time. And uh, I wanted to, th and uh, Dick had brought a big spool of uh, just hookup wire. I mean, thousands of feet. So I grabbed uh, a length of it from him. I was trying to figure out how to string it. And I realized uh, there was a bar of soap in the uh, hotel uh, bathroom. So I took the wire uh, wrapped it tightly around the uh, bar of soap, opened the window, threw it out the window, shoved the other end in the back of the coax connector on the radio and started working uh, deep Russians and, uh, and all sorts of stuff in uh, Central Europe, Central Asia. So uh, uh, the, the bar of soap you saw in the, in the uh, title illustration uh, is actually another, another antenna mounting tool <laughs> back to net. Well, that's a great thing. Uh, I've, I've been told over the years, it's always good to use organic objects whenever you're throwing a throw line. That way, if it gets stuck in the trees, it'll just dissolve eventually or be eaten eventually. So I've used uh, apples in the past and uh, other assorted fruit, but a bar of soap would be a great way to do it. Uh, I did find the link to the tackle box uh, 
kit. This is the, uh, it's a Plano 13505. It's actually a 5402 is the, the, the model number of it. And you get these nice little compartment cases, which are extra when you'd go through. But the information you need to hear, including the template to drill the holes on the side, is available in this handout. So that's available uh, for you to use. So back to our original show. So we have Mr. Oscar MacGyver himself is now going to speak. Go ahead, Oscar. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Marty and Dennis. Uh, th those are great experience to solve problems. But let's say we have a coax and a dog comes and bite it and cut it in two, or somebody cut the cable, the coax, or you need to connect a RJ8 with a RG58. It happens to be that you don't have the right PLs and right connectors. What do you do? You go home? No. Actually, you do, you put it back side by side and you, you tie up the shield and you can tie up also the, uh, the actual. And if you do it well, it's, they're going to be properly insulated and this for HF, even BHF and UHF it will work well. The interesting part is you measure the losses by making this connection with uh, twist nuts and or you, if you want to be more professional, you can you can weld it and you can put a shrinking tube, but this is something that you can do in five minutes and get it on the air. So you can see what you're going to do on the left, uh, the handwriting uh, diagram, and actually this was done today and it works. And, and if you go to the next uh, slide, you see how the right way of doing it with PL, if you know how to do a PL, many people doesn't know how to do a PL, and you can do it this way with the uh, tie knots and get it with the proper insertion loss. And as you can see in 40 meters, you can see that the antenna is the uh, having a good standing wave ratio at different frequencies, 7.025 and 7.091 or 7.270. And you can get the right uh, working and you put together two coax without PLs or without connectors. Next slide. Now, how you make this permanent? You can have a wood stack, put it there in, in a vertical position, hold, hold it together with a tie wrap, and put a glass container in top of it. And now you have it weatherproof. And believe it or not, you can even use uh, cable TV uh, 75 ohms, F-type or RG6, or even the one inch uh, cable uh, for running thousands of feet. And, you, and instead of spending $100 for a connector, you can do the same story and you get a 0.5 insertion loss, 0 0.5 insertion loss. It works well. Next slide. Well, just one second before you move on, just reminded me of something. I always use a glass bottle at the bottom of my extendable uh, fiberglass vertical so that when it's on the ground, it doesn't sink and get wet. So I always take a, either a plastic jar or a glass jar at the bottom of my vertical. So sometimes you forget you bring the antenna, you bring the radio, you got the headset, but you forgot the coax. Exactly. What happened if you forget the coax? 50 feet, 100 feet, power line, power extension. Yes, that's what we're going to use for coax. It is not the ideal connector or the ideal transmission line, but it works like a, like a parallel line. So next slide. We did it very, very simple. Two cables, 12 gauge. On the left, on the right there, without cutting the, 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 the extension cord, one side to the other. By the way, it works, doesn't matter the polarity. And hook it in right there, bending it into the actual of the of, of the uh, PL uh, SO239 and the uh, and the tie wrap to hold the ground. And we put it to work and we measure it. And we have uh, actually I made a wind link contact and that was done today in 40 meters, no problem. And the other side without coax using the power extension. You can see the same connection on the other side, hook it on the ground and, and then on the center and beautiful, get the power into the antenna. So believe it or not, if you get in a situation and you have no coax, you probably drop the ball and say, okay, I'm lost. But think about it. There are resources that you can use you can use twinlet, uh, telephone line, anything with two lines that you have and put it to work. By the way, the impedance is about 100 ohms. So 
in in 40, 80, 20 meters, it will work beautiful. So don't 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 drop. I mean, keep working and get things so get on the air. Next slide. It, well, in the true nature of a frugal ham, you notice that Oscar is not destroyed his extension cord, so he can use it later for electricity too. So I love that fact that you didn't just cut the ends off, but you actually just used it as is. So Oscar, what is the ahead. insertion loss of a pair of PL connectors? Point point uh, zero point five, the same the okay. same one as we were having uh, on the same example with the twisted uh, nuts. It's the okay, same thanks. insertion loss. Okay, thank you. And to measure the cable, actually, I needed a dummy load. And I this is this was introduced like solving a problem. I didn't have a dummy load to put it into the into the uh, extension cord. And we got two resistors of 100 ohms and put it in parallel, 49.9 ohm, non-inductive. Hook it up there, boom. And and we, that's the reason that we know the impedance of the uh, of the coax on the ideal situation. So we have to solve problems. I mean, and this is really MacGyver's ideas how to solve problems. Next slide. Now, this is actually in the same antenna that we have the coax that it was really resonating on the 40 meter band. And that was an MBIS antenna. And you can see by just analyzing the different uh, measurements of different frequency that the antenna is a little bit too long because the, the impedance is much better at 7.240. And if you go higher, it got better. So we probably, if you it's, it's going to be a little bit more permanent than this, probably you gonna need to shorten the antenna a little bit and that will solve the problem. So you, it's a question now to tune the antenna by the length of it to get it on the center of the frequency that you would plan to use it. So these are real measurement uh, done and, and, and practice. Next slide, please. Now, we were talking about chameleon and MBIS antennas and things like that. And there's an argument. This is a 40 meter antenna. We're having, let's say, 75 ohms uh, impedance. And actually, the good thing of putting the MBIS antenna about 10 to 12 feet, and you actually, I tune the antenna by this uh, fiberglass rod on the center, put it up and down until I get a better resonance to 50 ohm because the dipole, as you know, is going to be about 75 ohms and you make the inverted B just to get it close to 50 ohms. So you can tune it uh, with the ground and it's going to be an MBIS antenna. The same thing happens with 80 meter. Marty, you are right with the numbers, but that is the ideal condition and the impedance is going to be 75 ohms. If you play with it, push it up and down with the ground, a good, actually, for Dennis may not work because he's in a very dry desert, but I am, I'm in a very humid uh, ground. It works beautiful. So I tune it there and I get a very good uh, impedance and, and, and energy transfer. And this is what is important. Actually, for wind link, I, I normally use about 35 watts and work and make all the contacts, including all the way to Texas, which I, I tried. Actually, this antenna, I just used it about an hour ago uh, on, 40, on 40 meters with Texas. Go ahead, uh, uh, Anthony. Yeah, so sometimes you need to shorten. You don't have enough space, Oscar, so. So, so we have we have other ideas and we want to listen. We want to have questions. We want to listen, what are your MacGyver solutions? And we can probably have a follow-up. These are, these are ideas of what we can do. For example, a shortening half wavelength dipole to fit in a limited space. And we ha we have seen the answer. We have seen the simulations. is is workable, but uh, this is something that is also a MacGyver uh, technique. That it doesn't matter what you do with the dipole, like a U shape. And we want to present that in later in another follow up presentation. But I, we want to invite many people to come with the ideas and bring more answers about real solutions of actually real problems. Back to you, Anthony. Yeah, and there's even a. Uh... L LB Sibic has a uh, an article actually called F "Fold, Bend, and Mutilate: Making a Dipole Fit in the Space Available," and I have a link to that. I added another slide here, Oscar, that you might not have realized was going to be here, but another antenna trick. Uh, during the AWRL VHF contest, I only have a vertical, my 817 with a six meter rubber duck on it, but I really wanted a multi beam element, multi element beam to be able to work this VHF contest. 
So what I did is I went out on the balcony of the motel I was staying at, and I walked around, and I found metal railing, which I tried as a reflector, metal downspouts, even a metal pole that I used as a director. And what I would do is I'd listen for my receive signal to pick up to let me know that I was having some gain in the direction that I was the person I was trying to talk to. It was all search and pounce. And uh, I worked stations while I was waiting for my conference in, in Albuquerque that Sunday afternoon in the uh, contest. And the result, I received a certificate for the June uh, 2011 BHF contest and you notice single operator portable first place New Mexico section. So this proves two things that you can use uh, a wide variety of things to improve your simple antenna by using it as reflectors or, or, or uh, directors. And it also proves the fact that you should always send in your logs because you never know when someone else is not going to send one in. So some other antenna tricks Oscar mentioned using a fence tube vertical antenna. Uh, vertical antennas with a trap, low angle ver vertical antennas. And what we want to do now is we want to get your ideas on different projects. Uh, before we take your answers, though, we have one parting MacGyver shot here of an illustration of uh, when you forget the power cord for the back of your uh, stereo and you find two screws and attach some wires to it. Now, if I, this was me, I'd put something plastic in between here. I'm a firm believer in, in insulating uh, MacGyver objects with plastic so that the two terminals can't touch. But uh, so what we're gonna do now is we're going to uh, take, give you a turn to share your MacGyverisms. Uh, you can either type it into chat, raise your hand to speak. If you have uh, images you wanna share, we can let you share the screen. And, or if you just put a link or you put the object in the chat, I'll make sure it gets shared. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop my screen sharing here in a moment, and I will then take uh, questions. But before I do that, I just want to remind you again, tiny.cc slash full-eve, fools-eve will get you the slides, but they'll also be posted in the usual places um, when Dan posts the video. So again, I'm going to go ahead and stop the screen sharing. And we are now ready to take your MacGyverisms that you'd like to share with the group tonight. And we'll start off with any Rat Pack members who did not contribute to the slideshow needs to contribute now by uh, talking. Um, in the chat, there was a question about, there was a comment, the AWRL needs a no coax multiplier for field day. I think that's a wonderful idea. Don't be shy. Okay. <laughs> Since nobody else is speaking up, Anthony, I'll say something. Makeshift antennas in a hotel room. How about using a curtain rod? Been there, done that. Have to have a coupler, but I've done that in the past. So that works. Throwing a wire out the window and just letting it hang down the side of the building. <laughs> that can work too. Um, I will share one tale uh, of, of something that was kind of disastrous that we tried when I was in high school first licensed, uh, a friend of mine and I were trying to get this old military transmitter on the air. We didn't have a, a proper support for a long wire antenna. So we were uh, digging around and there's this big tree out in the corner of my folks yard and looking for an insulator. Couldn't really come up with something quickly to use as an insulator. So we just tied the wire to the tree, to a tree branch uh, and ran the wire into my bedroom where the radio was through a nylon window screen, right? So it's insulated. And needless to say, when we fired up the transmitter, which was like a 500 watt surplus Navy transmitter, we set the tree on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so something you don't want to do. But, you know, stupid us. Milk, uh, plastic milk bottle would have made a very easy insulator. Uh, things like that you can use very quickly. To, uh, to just cut out a piece of plastic and punch a couple of holes in it, you got an end insulator. If we'd done that, we wouldn't have set the tree on fire. But it was a, it makes for a great story, though. 
Or a wa- bottle of water. The, they work great. Yep. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I Anything? got another one, or actually two. Yeah, um, go ahead, Marty. Uh, <clears throat> one field day, uh, the person who was supposed to bring the six meter antenna didn't, and I was in charge of the six meter week, si- or the uh, VHF week signal station. And so I said, okay, we got some, co- anybody got some wire? So we got a hunk of uh, uh, just a house wire. I measured out 20 feet, which is a wavelength on six meters, uh, soldered one end to the, uh, to the shield of the coax, one to the center, and took it and draped it around the roof of the tent. Now, uh, don't tell the uh, RF exposure guys I did this. <laughs> I draped it around the roof of the tent, ran, plugged it in, and started working the Midwest on six meters. So, I mean, basically a full wave loop. That was it. It's, it worked fine. Uh, the other one, which I do not recommend you try, uh, but I survived and lived to tell about it. Uh, when I was going to UCLA, a friend of mine and I decided to do a, a, a multi-op contest from his mom's house. And there was, we had an amplifier, but there was no 220, and it was, it was hardwired for 220. So I looked around. I said, hey, I'll bet that light socket's on a different side of the line than this outlet. <laughs> so, so we put an adapter in there, shoved some wires in, brought them in, and sure enough, it was 220, and we got the amp going. And I absolutely don't recommend it, but hey, it worked. <laughs> Over. Well, Ralph has, I'm sorry, uh, let's see here. Uh, AJ6HOL, I used an on off switch from one of my Harbor Freight solar panels as a, uh, oops, as a push to talk for his transverter. And, you know, you talked about soldering things, Marty. I'm always ended up with either alligator clips, or as I found out today when I was doing a presentation for a UK group, they call them crocodile clips instead of alligators. I guess they use a different crocodilian for theirs. And I'm guessing someone probably in the, in the, in the, um, down in the Caribbean might call them caiman clips. So I'm not sure, you know, you can call, pick, choose your favorite crocodile, crocodilian ch- uh, clips, but I almost always end up using tape. So I'm always taping the metal, two metal objects together. You, know, you um, mentioned clip, uh, clip leads. If you ever have a clip lead with a banana plug on one end, banana plugs are a perfect fit into an SO239. Yes. Uh, from Tom W3 T- Tango Delta Hotel, use an alumi- use aluminum conduit instead of copper piping for J poles to reduce the weight. Use a PVC plumbing union to isolate an additional collinear section to radically increase the signal out over the horizon. So there's the improved uh, aluminum and PVC J pole. Again, reminder, everyone, put your items into the chat or let us know that you want to talk and we'll be glad to acknowledge you and uh, tell us your MacGyverisms, share them with the group. We know we're not the only ones that do these things. Yes, go ahead, Ralph. This is not really radio related, but um, one, once our, my congregation had a service and there was only one key that lived in the organ to turn it on and off. And um, uh, there are, right before the service, the organist came to me and said that there's no key. And we looked all over, we took the pedal keyboard off, we couldn't find the key. And I said, well, let's open up the case. And I said, I can hotwire the organ. <laughs> We went in the office and I got some paper clips. I went by the breaker panel, turned off the organ breaker and wrapped a sturdy paper clip around the, the two uh, leads to, on the back of the switch. And I went and I popped the breaker and uh, our organist played uh, what I would call some baseball park chords. Uh, and uh, he had a big grin on his face. So he closed things up and I said, I, I'm, Okay. Oh, you know, I left the breaker panel open and I went in the back and I was about to reach for the breaker panel when all the lights went off. <laughs> and I said, what, what could cause that? I just hot wired the organ. What, what could, there's no metal around there. It's a, in a wooden case. There's, and I'm racking my brains and I happened to look out this large window back there. And there were no lights in the apartment building across the driveway. So I walked over to the window and looked out sideways and the traffic signals were, were dark. 
and I'm going, oh, just my luck. There's a power outage when I hot wire the organ. And uh, so that's my story. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing it's illegal in Michigan to hot wire an organ, even under if you're the owner of the, if, if you're a member of the congregation. He says seen, <laughs> not illegal. It says seen. <laughs> well, yes. All right. Right. Uh huh. So well, there's that. But um, it turned out that a uh, squirrel had climbed into a substation and knocked out a quarter of the city. So. <laughs> Well, thank you. Please, again, either raise your hand, let me know in some way, type it in the chat. Um, we AJ6HOL, once I had to use the metal plate of a dolly to put a mag mount uh, on for field day. Car was parked in the lot. It did not work. You know, oh, and I just was handed a note here from my wife reminding me of something I did that I completely forgot about. I would have included this in the slideshow. Um, my college roommate was very inept at any type of mechanical operations, and we were out visiting him, him and his wife and his children in California. And uh, his son was a toddler, and he banged the uh, remote control on the corner of the table and broke the remote control. So I asked him to use a soldering iron. He looked at me like, what I was, what was I talking about? So I went out in his uh, woodshed and drove a nail through a piece of wood, came back in the house with their gas stove, heated the nail up, and proceeded to fix the two solder joints to join the, the remote control back together. And I found out how inefficient steel nails are at holding heat. Uh, so I had to keep uh, reheating them repeatedly. But... Um, the piece of wood and the nails and the gas stove were able to fix the remote control. And that's thanks to Linda K8ODP who handed me the note uh, when I was talking here. Uh, you know, if you ever notice, our spouses always detect our MacGyverisms faster than anyone else. And they always give us a hard time about it. Others that like to share, please go ahead. There's three people with hands up. I Oh, I see now. Peter, go ahead first. All righty. Uh, can I share my screen? Absolutely. Yeah, let's do this. <clears throat> so <clears throat> uh, can you see that? It's not up yet. There you go. It's fine. There we go. So I was uh, putting up a, uh, a new long wire antenna with the uh, ICOM tuner. You can see the tuner uh, there on the tree. And there was a uh, coax cable coming out of the tuner that was too short. So I wanted to make a inline splice, but I wanted it to be waterproof, but not permanent. So I basically went to the hardware store and bought a couple of pieces of uh, electrical uh, plastic pipe and uh, put the two pieces together like that so that the water can't get in. But the, <clears throat> there's a barrel connection in, in the middle of that whole thing. And you can slide it in and out to uh, change things around. That is great. And one of the things we often forget is that sometimes when you try and seal things up, they're not as waterproof as if you just keep the open ends pointing down. Now, of course, many times at field day, you might have had people assisting you who were not used to antennas with traps in it. They assembled the beam one year with all the little holes pointing up for each of the traps. And, of course, it was the <laughs> rainiest field day ever. We took it down and dumped, it, it dumped quarts of water on our heads. <laughs> Every trap was filled to the brim. Uh, go ahead, uh, Larry. Okay. Okay. Uh... We were doing a, actually, this is Little Larry's operation, and uh, for jokes and uh, giggles, we went up on the third floor of a hotel. The guy allowed us, and uh, no antenna. So we took a, as, and it was funny because the uh, general manager, I guess you call him, of hotels, laughed about it. So all we did was just, uh, he allowed us to cut the zip cord off the lamp. And we taped it to one of the windows. We made a basically a two meter dipole, and that worked out really well. We got uh, actually we got pretty good, better reception with that than we did with a uh, a standard uh, antenna at that time. And we were using a Kenwood at the a little Kenwood two meter. 
65 watts. And we were able to hit all the repeaters plus a little bit further distance. I guess that's because of the altitude. Well, that's great. Oh, by the way, don't use the uh, use a blue or a green one. It's easier to clean the windows than if you use the old uh, <laughs> white uh, tape. Mm. Mm. Brett, go ahead. Yeah, good evening, Anthony. Yeah, just, uh, just a funny one that I was down in Dayton one year and I have uh, had a uh, Tar Heel screwdriver antenna on the back of my uh, Buick Rainier. And uh, I, one of the fellows said to me, I wonder if that thing would work, uh, how it would work if we brought the radio in the, in the room. And I said, oh, it shouldn't be any problems. I, what I, we were up at the third level and uh, I put, uh, I had 150 feet, I had a hundred foot rather length of uh, coax and I uh, attached it down to the bottom of the antenna, I brought it up the side of the building and put it in the third floor. And I took a wire from the top of the Tar Heel antenna to the third floor railing. And we were talking to Europe, California, all over the place off this antenna with an ICOM 7000. And it was just amazing that this little antenna would work as hard as it did uh, for, I would say almost six hours. We started at nine o'clock, we were done by three in the morning. And we were talking to Europe, all over the world, basically. And I can't, couldn't do that at home off that 400 I've got in the backyard, but I just put a, uh, I put a wire up through the tree and it made an amazing difference for the amount of uh, contacts I could make just to have that extra 30 feet up over out of, out of the, over the trees and just looped it back down again. And it's just sort of halfway down the trees with a big huge truck bolt holding it on for weight. But it's amazing how well, they, how well it worked. But uh, it was just something strange. That's all. Just I'd put that in there. Very Thanks, good. Um, let's see. We don't have any more in the chat. Uh, please let me know if you have anything to share. Love to you know, have some. Brett, more. We Brett's, just got one. Uh, Brett's story reminds me of uh, Tom Schiller's quote. Uh, Tom Schiller of uh, BT antennas and so on. He says everything radiates. <laughs> So uh, Tom, a W3 uh, Tango Delta Hotel, you find you need an antenna mast, but none is available. Go to a rental outfit and rent the tallest extension ladder they have. Then rent one half as tall, two holes in the ground for the two beams uh, of ladder. Use the shorter ladder as a falling derrick, some pieces of pipe or rebar, some rope, and you have a 50-foot tower, uh, 50-foot mast uh, extension uh ladder mast so there's a great way to put up uh, a l very high object with a rental ladder other items please feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand or let me know and i will acknowledge you and we'd love for you to share more items Now, I, I, I have to tell you that not only did Oscar put together those tests, run the meters, but he, he took a day off work so he could spend doing this. So that's a true devotion. Not only does he do these MacGyverisms, but then he also tests them to make sure that the assertion loss is not low, is low enough to uh, not affect the operation. By the way, uh, we have used it several times, about three times. Although all kind of these solving this kind of problem, but you pull out this rabbit from the hat and it works and do it again if it's needed. Well, you know, I'm definitely going to be using your extension cord thing because I always end up going for field day somewhere and then it's not quite my coax is not quite long enough and you can't buy coax anywhere at a at a you know a hardware store grocery store. You can sometimes find a little bit of coax available for cable TV, but uh, that's even becoming harder to find uh when you're looking for that and it's usually short lengths no one has long lengths of it available um when i first got my license and i was back in my technician days i lived in a two a two-story duplex and uh i wanted to start trying out single sideband two meters so i picked up a used radio at a ham fest and I knew I wouldn't be able to put up an antenna outside. So using the plans from uh, Bill Orr's uh, beams, uh, homebrew beams, I got a two by two piece of wood, a bunch of uh, aluminum uh, clothesline, 
straightened it out and built this uh, 10 element two meter beam. I hung a um, eye hook in the ceiling with a short length of uh, nylon and then hooked it up to a, t a swivel for a fishing pole. And I could swing it around the in the room. It was on the second floor. The problem was it would start moving on its own or it would sag. So I put two drinking straws on, straws on both ends so it would rub against the ceiling. And my wife's yelling in the background. She forgot how Mickey Mouse it was, is what, she, what her quote was. And it, it, the thing was, my, we brought my son home from the hospital right after that, and it was his bedroom. So whenever I wanted to operate two meter single sideband, I had to make sure the baby was awake so I wouldn't wake him up when I used his, his room with the antenna mounted on the ceiling. And I went from, uh, I'm just in the Akron area, and I was able to get over as far as Toledo on two meter single sideband with my beam. So. Now that, that's I, uh, the proper kind of uh, mobile to to uh, keep a kid entertained. Yes, yeah, so, you know, putting an antenna up on the ceiling in the in their bedroom is a really good mobile choice. Yeah. Be beats little teddy bears. Yes. <laughs> Other uh, items anyone would like to share? We got a few minutes left. Please feel free to put things in the chat. Go ahead, Brett. Yeah, just one item, folks. Uh, I don't know uh, the areas that uh, all the people that are in on this, but I've just been watching the uh, radar, and I'm hoping that uh, everybody in Louisiana and Georgia and along the uh, Carolinas there is uh, safe from the storm coming across. It looks pretty bad. So I do all the can worn nets up here in southern Ontario and uh, watch the weather quite often. And it, uh, we're going to get some rain this weekend, but down along the Carolinas and what have you, just uh, be careful down there. Sorry about that. I just, let, just thought I'd pass that on. Thanks. Well, thank you. That's thank a, what you. we always say during our weekly uh, two meter net. Please pause in case there's any emergency traffic coming in. So thank you. I think Dan has his hand up. Yeah, um, just a couple observations. Steve Waterman left saying the tornado siren had just gone off. He left a note in chat. And um, what's happening for me is I'm realizing how commercialized amateur radio is. And, uh, you know, we stay awake nights dreaming of the next antenna we're going to buy. Uh, but I think buying a book and reading it and then making our own uh, is tr truer to the uh, ethos of amateur radio. So thanks for planting a lot of seeds and a lot of heads this evening. Well, thank you. And I have a note here in the chat from Tom. Gasoline has been contaminated with water by a genuine chamois and the gasoline will pass through the chamois, but the water will not. So I didn't realize that, but I guess yep. that, that that would work. Yep. You have to kill a chamois to do it though. Yes. <laughs> it's better than having no gasoline. Yeah, we're paying $1.85 a liter here. So you figure that out, it's around seven bucks a gallon. So it's uh, getting pretty pricey up here. Yeah, I just got back from Hawaii for the WPX contest, and gas was cheaper in Hawaii than it was in California. <laughs> yeah. Gas is cheaper everywhere than it is in California. <laughs> yeah, gas is cheaper everywhere than it is in California. So, Marty, did you fill up your tank before you drove home? <laughs> yeah, well, that, hey, they have an interstate highway there. <laughs> Don't know what it connects to. <laughs> uh, by the way, guys, you you know, uh, chamois are on the endangered species list. So be careful. Don't get caught. <laughs> Anyone else have anything you'd like to share? Please go right, let me know and uh, raise your hand or just uh, uh, De Dennis is waving his hand at something. He's excited. Dennis, you're muted or something. I'm not hearing you. We're not hearing you, Dennis. I think something's Hold wrong. Your mic in. No, one of his gizmos is being rebellious. <laughs> Use that cheap mic Dan gave you. <laughs> Let's try it again. There it is. It's working. There. I can see it. That's interesting. Anyway, you know, Anthony, you talking about the uh, makeshift two meter Yagi. Uh, I did a similar thing years and years ago, and this is back in <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, in fact, it's the days of Oscar seven and Oscar eight, I wanted to get into satellites and I didn't have a, a handy Yagi. We were actually out on vacation, but I had my mobile rig with me, the two meter uh, sideband rig and, uh, and a HF rig, uh, my FT-101. 
went to the hardware store, got a broomstick, aluminum clothesline wire, like you described, found some 75 ohm coax to make a ballon and a matching, you know, basically a matching section. Built a, it was probably 10 to 12 element Yagi and put it on a step ladder with a C clamp <laughs> to point it up in the air. And I made a ton of contacts. Yeah, it was pretty, you know, that, you, you, you know, you do what you can, you know, with, with the stuff you got available. And, and, you know, when you're out on vacation and you don't have it with you, you want to try something new, hardware store is your friend. You know, I had, when you I had a six meter antenna with no tower. And so I, uh, I put up a step ladder and uh, yeah. like you said, then a C clamps clamped uh -huh. it to the thing. It was about six feet above the ground and I worked all over the country at a hot opening and I would have missed it. <laughs> there you go. That's amazing. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> speaking of six meters, I was driving, uh, my brother was driving me somewhere and I was in the car and I had my 817 with me. And uh, actually this one, the 817, it was an earlier, it was one of the Yesu, uh, I'm sorry, one of the ICOM little uh, vertical and 502, I come 502, six meter radio. And he, uh, I heard some noise on it, but I couldn't make anyone out. So I said, stop the car, stop the car. So I got out and put it on the hood of his car and boom, magically all the signals came up because I now had a good ground plane. And uh, I worked New Hampshire from the parking lot in Ohio on uh, six meters with the little 502. And uh, he was impressed, but um, Dennis, you reminded me on my beam, I forgot to mention, the feed on that was made by having a section of 300 ohm uh, twin lead that was then hooked up to the uh, uh, the matching unit, which was made with a piece of copper uh, pipe, a thin piece of copper pipe, or I'm sorry, a, a copper rod. Okay, anyone else before we close up for the evening? We got one announcement. Yeah, go ahead, Marty. Uh, the, the committee members know this, uh, but the press release is going out, but our own uh, Dan K7 REX uh, was just awarded a YASME Foundation Excellence Award. So congratulations, oh. Dan. Yeah. And Diana has her hands up. Yes, go ahead, Diana. Hey, I just wanted to thank everybody for uh, sharing and this presentation. I know it was really fun for me. I love doing MacGyver things and I plan on sharing it with some of my friends who love doing MacGyver things and new students in radio. So uh, this one's a real keeper for me. Thank you. Uh, Tom, uh, W3TDH, I needed a way to transmit following an earthquake. I used the Johnson matchbox to load up the flashing around the cornice of the building i got out and was able to send a message to my aries contact so yes that good old spouting and cornice and all those uh decorative metal objects all will transmit if you match them okay well everyone I'd like to thank you for uh for making our second annual uh beginning of april uh group activity work it's fun to put together these as a committee and get to talk to you. And I've been your host, Anthony KZT, this evening. But again, most of the work was done by all the committee members. And uh, we have Oscar then. We have Oscar then to to uh, make sure everything is measured so that we have proof that it actually worked. So again, I'd like to thank everyone. And tomorrow night, Dan, you want to tell them about tomorrow night? Am I going to help out tomorrow night? No. What, what's the session tomorrow night? Oh. Um... I have to look at the. I have to look at the. It's schedule. just. It's just me. Oh, okay, so right. Marty can right. Marty can give it. <laughs> uh, tomorrow is going to be uh, called "Prepare for the Worst: uh, Operating Meeting Operating Challenges in the Gambia." And if you want to talk about things going wrong and how we overcome, uh, it's a story that I think you'll find very interesting. Um, it's alleged that Mark Twain said. Um, in regard to prepare for the worst. If you eat a live frog first thing in the morning, the rest of the day will be better. <laughs> or worse. Or worse. <laughs> yeah, congratulations, Dan. Well, thank you. It was well, a surprise to me. I, I never heard of that award, but whatever it is, you certainly deserve it and more. Well, I'm told I can use it as a club. But... Keep <laughs> well, it won't keep the committee in check. We know that. 
Yeah, we keep we keep all the naysayers away. Bang, bang, go away. All right. Well, thank you, Anthony, for assembling everything. Thank you, Oscar, for all the great ideas and Dennis and everybody. Appreciate all the contributions. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marty, for your help as well. Thank you all. Good night.